Welcome to this week's episode of Chess TV. Today's headlines are that the Icelandic Championships are being played, the American Championship offers challenges to its audience, and a seven tight victory in open Kaiposh. In the opening school, Alfred will continue the analysis of the King's Gambit. Today's chess puzzle is the checkmate in four moves. And in the chess history, Arne Johansson presents Roy Lopez and an important chess book. So enjoy! The 6th Torneo Abierto Internacional UNED Guadalajara was played on April 10th as an 8th round Swiss Rapid Tournament. 152 players took part and the time control was 20 minutes for the whole game. The playing venue was Hotel Tripe Milia in Guala Guadalajara, Spain. Famous trainer and author Boris Zlotnik took clear first place with 7.5 points after scoring 7 straight victories and eventually allowing one draw in the final round. Cuban Grandmaster Holden Hernandez took second place with 7 points. Congratulations! The 34th edition of the San Sebastián International Chess Open has just started at Grosxaje Taldea, which is the playing venue of the tournament, up until April 26, when it concludes. This edition is bringing together more than 170 players from 26 different countries and 46 titled players. The tournament is a 9-round Swiss with a rate of play of 90 minutes for the game plus 30 seconds per move. Every day, 16 games will be broadcasted live through the official website fgiedres.org. Grandmaster Kevin Spraget from Canada is the top-seeded player, followed by Viktor Kochnoi and Mark Narcisiso. The Serbia Women Chess Championship 2011 is taking place from April 11th to 22nd in Belgrade. 12 players participate in the round robin tournament. Women Grandmaster Angeleja Stojanovic is the defending champion and Maria Magnakova is the top seed. The games can be followed live at beosing.com. The Icelandic Chess Championship started last Friday, April 15th, in the resort of Eldar near the town of Egilstradir. Ten of Iceland's strongest players, including three grandmasters, are competing for the national championship in an event featuring the strongest lineup for years. The nine-round championship is being held in the eastern part of Iceland for the first time in 21 years. Last time around was in 1990 and the championship was then won by 15-year-old Hedin Stengrimsson, who later became a grandmaster. In addition to Sten Grimson, only one other former champion, Grandmaster Henrik Danielsen, who won the championship in 2009, is participating this year. That might sound a bit odd, but that's just because 11-time and defending champion, Grandmaster Hannes Stefansson, won't be participating. Chess enthusiasts can follow a live broadcast on the Icelandic Chess Federation's website, skaksamband.is. As we all know, the U.S. Championships are being played right now in St. Louis. But what you might not have known is that before the start of the first round, fans of the U.S. Championships could log on to a Fantasy Chess website to make their selections from a combined 24-player field and to fill out a championship bracket to determine the winner of each event. The Fantasy Chess was free to play and event organizers are giving away some fantastic prizes to the winners, including a one-hour lesson with two-time US champion and world number eight grandmaster Hikaru Nakamura with a commemorative chess set from House of Staunton, a limited edition set that is made especially for the 2011 US Championship and US Women's Championship and comes with a certificate of authenticity signed by all competitors. 614 teams have been created, so all we can do now is wait for the results. Visit fantasychess.stlouischessclub.org to read more. The International Chess Tournament Open Karposh was held from April 2nd to 9th at the Repelec venue in Skopje. The playing format was a 9-round Swiss and 74 players participated. Among them were an impressive number of 18 grandmasters. Seven grandmasters shared the first place with 6.5 points each, but top seed Robert Marcus was declared champion on tiebreak. It should be noted that junior Lazar Nestorovic, the youngest in the famous Belgrade chess family, earned an international master norm while facing seven grandmasters in the tournament. Congratulations! 
The Chinese Chess Association, with the support of Ningbo Municipal Government and Ningbo Sports Bureau, are announcing the 2011 World Team Chess Championship in Ningbo, China. The event will be held from July 15th to 26th at the New Century Grand Hotel Ningbo. Ten federations are entitled to participate in the championship. China, the host country, Russia, the last winner, Ukraine, Israel and Hungary, the top three from the Chess Olympiad, Azerbaijan, India, USA and Egypt, one team from each continent and the FIDE president's nomination, which is Armenia. So far, China, Russia and Armenia have submitted their teams. The fourth memorial, Pedro Lescano Montalbo, is taking place from April 18th to 24th in Gran Canaria, Spain. The nine-round tournament is organized by Club de Ayadres Calla Insular de Ajarros de Canarias. 94 players are participating, including seven grandmasters, with top seed Julio Granda rated 26-15. Follow the tournament on ayadrescanarias.com. The European Chess Union, Italian Chess Federation and Comité Valutain de Chex organized the 11th European Senior Chess Championship on April 6th to 14th in Cormayeur, Elsta Valley in Italy. A total of 101 players participated, men and women together, and the championship was played over nine rounds following the Swiss system. Grandmaster Mihai Suba from Romania became the European Senior Champion after taking a clear first place with seven and a half points. Crucial was his victory against, against Grandmaster Misu Sebalo in the penultimate round. Grandmaster Viktor Krupechnik was in position to catch Suba with a win against uh, Fide Master Malke Pertes, but the pressure must have gotten to him and he lost the game. The silver medal went to International Master Vladimir Okotnik thanks to superior tiebreak score, while Grandmaster Gennady Timoshenko won the bronze. Legendary player Grandmaster Nona Gaprindashvili won the title of Women's Senior Champion despite the last round defeat against the Italian Antonio Rossino. Rossino thus claimed his fifth Italian senior title and Gaprindashvili won the gold only after edging out women international master Galina Strutinskaya on the second tiebreak criteria, should be added. Strutinskaya won the silver, while women grandmaster Tamar Kmedashvili won the bronze. The European Senior Chess Rap in 2011 took, that took place a bit earlier on April 4th to 5th in the same playing venue was won by grandmaster Viktor Krupeshnik. Congratulations! And finally, chess is becoming a school subject in Armenia. The country that is already famous for its super talented chess players is now recognizing the positive effects that chess has on children by making chess into a school subject in primary schools. The government decided to allocate 177 million Armenian drums to the Chess Academy of Armenia, which aims at organizing chess lessons at Armenian elementary schools, the publication of chess books and teachers training. The government also allocated 386,000 Armenian drums to the Armenian Ministry of Education and Sciences to buy necessary equipment. week we began with analyzing the king's gambit and we will continue with that in this week's episode. The moves introduced in the opening are e4, e5 and f4. White is here sacrificing a pawn and if black takes it, white will get a very strong presence in the center leading to a strong initiative. But if black wouldn't like to go into this defense and instead be the attacking party in this opening, black shouldn't take. Instead, black should play d5, opening up the center and exposing the white king. According to the main line, white should here take the pawn on d5, and instead of recapturing, black should play e4, hindering white from developing his knight to f3. White can of course not allow the pawn to stay on the current square, and should play d3 in an attempt to remove it. Black should play knight to f6 here, and Alfred, what happens next? Last week we saw what happened after white take, taking on e4 here, and it did seem as a dreadful continuation for white. 
we learn that White has to be really careful, but more importantly, play very precise. Still, D takes on E4 is White's best move in this position, and Black recaptures with the knight on F6. Here, Black threatens Bishop to C5 and Queen to H4 check. Queen to h4 check poses the more direct threat, which is white while white protect himself from that move first by playing knight to f3. Black answers by playing bishop to c5, forcing the white king to stay in the center by preventing white from castling. And here white really only has one move to play. In our previous episode we saw what happened after c4, a very careless move from white. And it does seem as if white is in quite some trouble. And white actually is, unless white plays very precisely. But if white does so, white might even get the advantage. Today we'll see what happens after white's best move, queen to e2, pinning the knight on e4. Important to notice is that black can't take the pawn on d4 here, since that would lead to white winning material after knight f to d2. Knight to c3 instead of this move does surely seem nice, but it doesn't work since black then would be able to play bishop to b4, pinning the knight and ruining white chances for gaining material advantage. After knight f2 d2, black will try to protect the knight by playing f5, and now follows knight to c3, queen to e6, an exchange on e4, and queen to h4 check, winning the bishop on c5. To take the pawn on d5 is simply not a good idea. It is far better for black to play bishop to f5 instead. White has one plan in mind, and that is to exchange all of black's active pieces. And that is best done by playing knight to c3, which is followed by queen to e7, bishop to e c3, an exchange on e3, knight takes on c3, queen takes on e7 check, king takes on e7, b takes on c3, and bishop takes on c2. The material is equal, but even though white has attained a slight advantage because of the more active position. White can here for example play king to d2, which if black plays bishop to g6, is followed by knight to d4. We can easily see that the a white active pawns are limiting black opportunities to develop while helping white to exploit the black's position's weaknesses. But with that, we will end this week's episode of The Opening School. We will see you again next week when we will continue analyzing the king's gambit. But instead of seeing what happens after black's third move e4, we will see what happens after c6. So see you then. Last week we solved the chess puzzle with checkmate in two moves and it, that was a bit too easy for you. Because many of you have asked for it, today's chess puzzle will be much harder. Today we will have to find a checkmate in four moves. The position is taken from a game between Vishwanathan Anand and Alexander Chernin played in 1999. Anand played white and checkmate his opponent in four moves, so you have one minute to figure out the four moves and let's see if you are as good as the world champion. Good luck! This is undoubtedly a tough position to find the right moves in. White has of course a stronger position, but in pure material terms he has a rook against three pieces. But let's focus on the white attack. If the knight wouldn't have been standing on e8, we would have been able to checkmate on g7. But we can't wait for the knight to move, instead we must continue to build on the attack against black. So let's play down the pawn to g6. 
The plan is obviously to checkmate on h7. Black has here three alternative answers. He can capture the pawn with the knight, the pawn can capture the pawn, and the queen can check on h3. If the pawn captures on f6, we take on f7 with the pawn and a check. This is a double check, of course, forcing the king to go to f7, and then we checkmate with the queen on g6. So if the pawn instead captures on g6, the rook takes back with a check. Black can only block the check with the knight, and then the queen just takes it with a checkmate too. But did you notice that that was only three moves? Well, it was, so that means that black has a better defense, and that is queen to h3 check, of course. Anand's opponent, Chernin, played this move for two reasons. First, he just wanted to prolong the game with a move, but then he also wanted to make the f rook leave the f rank. This did, however, not stop Anand from checkmating him. Anand captured the checking queen, Chernin played knight to f6 with the plan to guard h7 and prevent a checkmate there, and now there is no rook on the f rank to capture the knight. What we play here is to take on f7 with a check. This is a double check again, the king must capture the checking pawn, and we have a checkmate on g6 with the queen. Well, four moves wasn't that bad, was it? <laughs> the tough part was to find the first move, which wasn't a check nor a sacrifice, which we usually see in these chess puzzles. But as soon as we realized that white had a strong attack and that we only had to continue to build it up, the puzzle became quite easy. So you can now proudly let everybody know that you've managed to solve a chess puzzle with a checkmate in four moves. Well done! Last week I talked about the first surviving printed chess book, but it had little influence on the chess development. It was Spanish and was published in 1497. And if we stay in Spain but move ahead some decades, we encounter Rui Lopez and his much more influential book that appeared in 1561 in Spain and uh, 23 years later in Italian in Rome. It uh, is this interesting book that I will talk about today. But first, some facts about Rui Lopez. Rui, or Rodrigo Lopez de Segura, was a Spanish priest and later bishop in Segura in Spain. He was born around 1530 and became approximately 50 years old. He was depicted like this on a stamp from Cambodia. He had one thing in common with Lucena, the author of the 1497 book, namely that he lived and studied in Salamanca. He became famous for playing chess at the Spanish court of Philip II, or Felipe as was his Spanish name. Ruy Lopez is also said to have played against the king himself, who besides being known for his armada, many wars and four wives, was also very fond of chess. According to legend, Ruy Lopez played against the king, sitting on his knees on a pillow across from the king. That situation was still better than for the nobility and others who were spectators, who had to remain standing for the whole games. Ruy Lopez was known as the strongest chess player in Spain when he in 1560 was sent to Rome on behalf of the church. There he got his hands on Damiano's chess book, which he quickly ruled out as obsolete, and decided to write the new one himself. The author of that book was Pedro Damiano, who was Portuguese, but the book was published in Italy and was the first Italian chess book when it appeared in 1512. It was also the third ever after the now lost book from 1497 and Lucena's book from 1497. Sa jag fel där va, för det första? Jag, jag tror det, ja, just det. It was also the third ever after the now lost book from 1495 and Lucena's book from 1497. 
Damiano's book is also the first to definitely state that the chessboard should be set so that the lower left corner should be a black square. Damiano also gives some advice about blindfold games, which apparently was popular already at that time. During his visit to Rome in 1560, Rui Lopez played against and defeated all the best Italian players, including Giovanni Leonardo di Bona da Cutri, whom he would meet later again. Well, let's return to the Rui Lopez book, which he published the year after the visit to Rome. It was entitled Libro della Invenzion Liberali Alto del Juego del Ajedrez, or something like that, which translated into English would be about a book about the origin and the art of playing chess. It also appeared in Venice in Italian 23 years later, entitled Il Gioco degli Scacchi di Rui Lopez Spagnolo. Rui Lopez's book is considered one of the pillars of the European chess literature and provides a description of the chess and the origin of chess. It might be especially interesting to note that he describes the Cosling rule. Well, this is a copy of the Italian edition from 1584, which was also been equipped with some woodcut illustrations. The book also includes an analysis of openings, including a study of what we today call Spanish opening, or simply Rui Lopez. During the years 1574 to 1575, the Italians Leonardo da Cutri, together with Paolo Boy, visited Madrid and both defeated Rui Lopez in matches that both were played in the presence of the king. But a game that Rui Lopez won against Leonardo da Cutri in 1575 is the following miniature. Well, we end here for today and we'll return next week with a new theme, so see you then. We'd like to thank you all for watching this episode of Chess TV and we hope that you'll watch next week as well when we're back with a new episode. Have a great week until then. Bye.